Hello, Finn. Hello. You are a philosophical practitioner, and moreover, you are a professor of, philosoph of philosophical practice at the University of Olbo in northern Denmark. And since you practice various formats of philosophical practice, let me ask you this question. What for you are the main ideas, the main principles, the heart of philosophical practice? I like the, the heart of philosophical practice. Um, for me, at least, it is, um, first of all, what Plato already said, that to philosophize, to really going into a philosophizing, uh, has to do with beginning in a wonderment, deeply fundamental wonderment, Taumensein. But not just to begin in wonder, but also be, to be led by wonder and to end in wonder. And that's fundamental. So the phenomenology of wonder, wonderment, is very important for me, as in contrast to the phenomenology of curiosity or the phenomenology of an analytical inquirement or conceptualizing. Wonderment is something else. It's more connected to being in an ontological relation with the world as opposed to being in only an epistemological, conceptualized graphs of the world. So, so, so the notion of, of wonderment, especially not just the person being in wonder, but the people who are together, it could be a group, it could be one-to-one, -one, but that, that there may come in, that there may arise a kind of event, which I call the event of a community of wonder, a community of wonder. And that is extremely important for me because if the the practitioner, the facilitator, uh, is not also himself or herself in a wonderment. Well, it's not really going in the right direction, so to speak. Uh, we are not there. We are not standing then in the openness. We are not standing then in the, a fundamentally um, uh, vulnerability. Um, and then, we, if we are not in this fundamental vulnerability, we will not be enough open to receive. Um, the call of the lived experience. So that's another thing. So to get into a wonderment, I think we have to, first of all, be touched by something. You know, we have to be in contact with not reality in an empirical sense, but life as such, or the phenomenon as such. So when I'm more theoretical, talking about a philosophical practice is really a fundamentally existential, uh, phenomenological and hermeneutical process, and Socratic dialectical. So there's different momentums in a philosophical practice, as I understand it. And when I try to get people into this move, move uh, towards uh, um, uh, wonderment, um, I, all, I try to always start making, uh, get them to uh, um, start from a lived experience. So, for instance, if, if uh, the, the, the question is, what is really love? What is it? You know? So instead of going into a conceptualized, what do you think about it? Uh, no, we start from a lived experience. How does it, no, well, how does it feel? Yes, but I'm not going into a, a, a psychological uh, introspection of how does it feel to, but much more, much more like um, what, give me an example, just give me an example from a lived experience from your own life where you felt that here I w was in a loving relation or I was loving something. What, how does it, how does it feel to be in such a situation? And by walking around this with the, the, the guest, uh, the visitor, uh, we slowly get into uh, listening from the inner side of the word of uh, love. What is the concept of the word of love? But we, we listen to it from the inner side. But not in a psychological sense, but a more existential sense. So uh, what, what kind of, of observations or things uh, people may say in such a situation in your experience? Well, well, it's typical. If, if I'm, when I'm doing it, I could do it with nurses or whatever, uh, teachers or professional. But for instance, a nurse, if we are going to talk about, you know, they would like to come up with the, with the question, what is a loving relation when I'm with the relatives of a dying patient, for instance? What, how do I connect? 
then they would, uh, if they are going to describe the lived experience, then they will start typical by having a more outstanding, you know, you stand up from outside and looking at it. And the, the words, the, the, the voice, the, the way of describing it is like more objective, you know. But then I try to help them to, 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 no, 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 you should just tell as if it was a telling, you know, a, a story. And then they tell. And then I hear what they want to tell me about their lived experience of love. But, but then we are, not yet, we are not there yet, because then we only hear the person's own wanting to point to something. What I want to and hope for in our dialogue is that we both will land in a, a wonderment about what is it that life in that situation, the voice of life in that situation, would uh, like us to see. So I'm not so interested in the particular person's particular lived experience as such. It's more like, what can this particular lived experience help us to see about this, the moment of, or the, the, the essence of love in this uh, theme? How, how can we understand from the particular what the universal is in the particular? How do you help them become, uh, e enter wonder as opposed to just being curious? Uh, so the first step, I said, I said there was five moment, momentums. The first momentum is the phenomenological. I have to be in the lived experience. And being in the lived experience, then the second momentum would be to, to listen to, to um, in a more hermeneutical, philosophical way, what might be the tacit assumptions, worldviews or uh, values, which is taken for granted in the lived philosophy, in the lived experience. Um, and there might be many themes, many assumptions, but then I ask them to, to, to focus. You know, philosophy philosophize more from the heart in the, in the sense that, okay, there's a lot of themes, but where is the heat of the moment? Which of these many assumptions uh, is speaking to you at all, uh, mostly? You know? And then say, okay, this, this, this assumption is important. And then we dwell on this uh, assumptions, and I ask more critical, humoristic, Socratic, in a Socratic way, I, I, I go around it. And then the person uh, gets more and more uh, wondering, uh, wondering about it, you know, what, what is it really? I thought I knew what uh, something was. And uh, he or she becomes more silent in, in that way. So that's the that's uh, the finding, if you could say, that, that is about finding your personal uh, uh, existential or philosophical wonderment. The third momentum is, in, in my approach, is to say, okay, now we have a personal experience. That's important to find that in a phenomenological sense. Then I have a personal philosophical wonderment. And that's difficult to find that, but when you have it, okay, this, this is mine, you know. But now we want to elevate it. Now we want to take the, the lived experience, the personal little, little lived experience, the personal little, little, little um, wonderment and put it in what I call the cathedral. And the cathedral is like, whoa, now we are in the dialogue with the grand stories and the grand wonders of hu uh, human mankind. Uh, so if the, the theme, or the, one of the wonderments uh, around what is love has been, well, to be in love, it seems that in my lived experience has to do with, with, um, with, um, yeah, with what um, um, a humbleness, for instance, being in a humble way. That has just been a tacit assumption when I'm talking about love. So now I will bring this: what is really humbleness? You know, my personal wonderment into the cathedral, and then I will. Uh, uh, ha, um, ask some of the great thinkers, and that that shouldn't necessarily be philosophers. It could also be poets or whatever, you know, uh, any musicians. Uh, so, so uh, when we are in the cathedral, we should move around with the big guys and girls and <laughs> the, the the big artists and so on in a way that is Socratic, because if I just take a big story. I will be, um, how do you say that, um, easily um, Persuade. yeah, persuaded it, or, or, or yeah, well, I will be uh, taken away by this grand horizons. 
So it's important to have a, a counter uh, story as well to, to move or to navigate in that. So when you are in the third um, momentum, you will have help from the gig, from the big stories, and that is a is a very important aspect as well. So the fourth level, or not level but momentum, then would be okay. Now we have been with the great ideals and horizons, but but uh, where are you in all these? Who and where are you in all those great thoughts? So the fourth momentum would be a kind of existential grounding. And when, uh, when we go into that room, or in, in that momentum, I could bring in more what Pierre Adot would call uh, spiritual exercises, more um, silent, and you, and your, some of your uh, thinking as well, you know, your, some of your practices. I like that. And, but also more aesthetic approaches. So I loosen up a little bit from this uh, more Socratic to bring in more um, aesthetics. Um. So yeah, in the fifth um, momentum, um, then I'll try to, uh, we try to connect to their daily life, you know, the practice uh, as nurses, being on a hospice, being on a hospital, whatever. But what does it mean to connect uh, when you have been through a Socratic building process or there's a one community of wonder? Well, there's different things. One thing is the insight, maybe a tacit kind of insight that you feel now you have about the, the topic. Well, you, 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 are not, you, are not, you, you do not have a clear answer. What I th hope to get through a Socratic dialogue is not a clear answer, but is a deeper wonderment. Because I deeply think, in a Gardaman sense, that if you are in a deep wonderment, you will also be more receptive to a deeper understanding that it will arrive, which you cannot grasp in a meth methodological way, but you have to be open. So going away from Socratic practice, you might get answers because you are more open in life. But that's another. So that's one thing. The, the other thing is the, the uh, what I call uh, um, the deed. Um, what does it mean to you know, the Socratic dialogue can be a kind of um, a pureness or kind? Sorry, <laughs> yeah, it can be a kind of um, um, frenetic experience that you will be better to have frenetic uh, actions where you practice wisdom in, 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 um, in more in tune with the situation or the relation you are in in your daily life. One last question yeah. about the practicalities. How long does usually the, 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 the process you usually take and where does it take place? Oh, that depends, really. It could be just a short exercise where they get a feeling of it, like when I do it with students or, or psychologists who want just to have a sense of it. But what I like and what, where, where we get deeper into the things is, for instance, when I, when I do a kind of Socratic phenomenological action research, which can be two or three years. And I've been doing research projects as that when I, when I'm, I am asked to go to a design school where the question is, what could be the relation between wonderment and creativity? And then we work with these five momentums as a way of articulating more intuitive, tacit knowledge and get into a community of wonderment around that and then articulate what happens there. Or it could be, as I'm doing right now, a hospice, where I first uh, work with wonder-based dialogues and uh, reflection with the staff, with the priest, the psychologist, the nurses, and then after they had got a sense of it, uh, they write about their stories, they tell the stories, and we, we um, uh, articulate, uh, they articulate some of the, uh, their experience, and we have a wonderment around that. And we see how this kind of uh, being in a wonderment also make them more open uh, in the meeting with the relatives or the patient or themselves when they have more existential ethical questioning. Mm. Well, that's fascinating, or rather I should say wonderful. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much, Finn. Okay. Thank you too.